thank you for joining us for today's NADA webinar. My name is Ashley Smith from NADA, and I will be your host. From all of us at the National Automobile Dealers Association, we're happy to have you. Today's webinar will be recorded and available on NADA's website at nada.org slash education. As a quick reminder, NADA Education is an online resource and learning tool available to you and your entire team as a free member benefit. Every one of your staff members can create their own login and access over 500 online resources today, including NADA Show 2020 workshop recordings. We have an hour scheduled for this webinar, including Q&A. Please type any questions you have for our presenters into the Q&A panel. You can find this located at the bottom of your screen at any time during the presentation. At the end, we'll ask as many questions as we can in the time allotted. Our topic today is auto sales and finance in the new customer first era. Joining us today is Pete Margaros, Senior De Dealer Relations Manager at Automotive Mastermind. And joining P is Josh Abair, Senior Director of Market Development at TransUnion. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time and joining us today. Pete, the floor is yours. Ashley, thank you so much. And on behalf of our team at Automotive Mastermind and our partners at TransUnion, uh, we are really looking forward to spending some time with you today, about 45 to 60 minutes, talking about the consumer first era. Um, before we jump into the details as far as what we're going to be talking about today, just wanted to get more, through one more public service announcement um, on behalf of NADA. And if you take a look at your screen, you'll see the details there. And I'll leave that on for a quick second, and we'll move to really why we're here. But before we jump into that, I'd like to tell us, talk to you guys a little bit about us. First, I'd like to introduce Josh Abair. Josh is Senior Director of Market Development at TransUnion. Josh, a little bit about you. Uh, so, been most of my life in automotive, 20 plus years, uh, full life cycle from retailing, software, marketing, finance. Um, I've helped small independent dealers to the largest of dealer groups and worked with the manufacturers. And I currently lead TransUnion's business and planning, especially as it relates to modern retailing and uh, the disruptions that we see coming about uh, in the last few years. Thank you very much, Josh. A little bit about me. Um, as you can see on the screen, I've got 25 years of experience, more than that actually, in the business, uh, both in retail as well as the OEM space. Also spent time with big data companies like Experian and Equifax during my career. So this particular webinar, even though I think it's my sixth or seventh with NABA this year, is extremely exciting to me because we're going to be talking about the most important part of buying a car, um, which is actually paying for it. Um, so you're going to find out some great information. But I've also spent time with me uh, with NADA. So for me, it's kind of a homecoming, uh, being able to support NADA in the role that I'm in now, having worked on the dealer operations side with NADA. Um, it's really exciting for me to be back um, in that role. So as I mentioned before we jumped into introductions, we're going to talk about why we're here. Because I think for those of you that are that are here today, you're probably saying, well, what, why is this important and, and why are we here? You know, what, what's, the, what's relevant here? What are you really going to tell us at the end of the day that we really may not know? Um, or what are you going to tell us that's really going to make an impact as far as we think about 2021? 2020 has been unbelievably challenging, hasn't it? Wouldn't you agree, Josh, that it's been just a roller coaster ride? In, in all aspects. In all aspects, it has just been an absolute roller coaster ride. You know, but the good news is, you know, consumers and dealers have been strikingly resilient. You know, and that's that's because of who we are, especially in this industry. You know, we never say never. We want to fight the fight, and we want to survive at all costs, regardless of what situation it's in. And this has definitely been a situation that none of us have ever seen in our lifetime, and hopefully we never see it again. But we're still in it. The good news is, is that credit report volume, as I think about how people pay for cars, the first aspect of it is let's find out what their credit is. So credit report volume is largely rebounded. You know, delinquency, you know, and, and those factors affecting customers' ability to pay, you know, has really started to stabilize. You know, and then when we look at profit numbers in the stores, 
they're through the roof. And when we look at sales numbers, they're starting to bounce back. Certainly much better than the industry forecasted earlier this year, when in March, according to our sister company at IHS Market, those numbers were down to under 9 million units was the forecast if we look at April. And now we're bouncing back, not nearly where we thought we were going to be at the beginning of the year, but a whole lot better than 9 million as we think about where those numbers are. So the thing that I really want to start with is a data point, because we're going to talk about a lot of data today, and it's really important for us to understand that we are going to load you with a lot of data, but we're going to give you that information so you can make those informed decisions. So for the data geeks that are joining us today, like Josh and me being the closet data geek that I am, it's exciting. But for those of you that aren't, I think you'll find it exciting as well because it allows you to make objective decisions at the end of the day. I don't have to rule with my gut anymore. I can rule with using data-driven intelligence. And there's a lot of it out there, and we're going to sift it down to what's relevant and help you understand that better. But before we jump into that, I'd like to ask you guys a question. So if I could ask Ashley to pop up today's first poll question. Because if I think about the thing I'd like to start out with, it's kind of level set. How has your dealership performed in 2020? If you guys could take a quick minute and answer that, we'll watch the answers come in. Has it been better, what you thought, or worse? And then we'll talk about it a little bit but then we'll jump really into some of the details behind the performance. So we'll give this another few seconds, um, and then we'll jump into those details. And if you guys could take a quick second and answer this poll question, that would be great. There's a couple more we're going to ask you throughout this session, um, but the first place we wanted to start is the level set. I want to know, how have you done? That's the first thing I would ask myself is, how do I think I've done? as I look at 2020. The good news is, is that most of you that have answered this, and if you guys could take that off the screen now, has, we've got 86% that have said better than expected, you know, which is about what we thought, because for those of us like myself that consult with dealers and dealer groups from our company's perspective, and for Josh who really analyzes the industry and looks at the industry, from a market development and a business development perspective, you know, we kind of expected that because the thing we're hearing is even though volume is down, profits are absolutely astronomical. And so that's the good news is we've got a lot that we can prop ourselves up, prop ourselves up over. And the interesting thing about it is volume is starting to rebound as well. And the indicator for me from a volume perspective is not how many internet leads am I getting, is not even how many sales am I seeing. But the thing I want to understand is are people committing to buy a car? And the first step to commitment is the credit app, isn't it, Josh? I, I would definitely say so. And, and as we look at uh, and we move into the data looking at this, you know, understanding you know, the application, we know that most consumers are going to finance their vehicle. In fact, 85 90% of consumers are going to do that, whether it's new or used. And so when we look at volume, uh, we take a little different take on it um, from what we what we see other forecasting companies use. And while we, we use those as inputs for our own forecasting, you know, when we look at the health of a marketplace, it's really about number of transactions that are happening, right? And uh, so we can see that through inquiry volume. And of course, uh, here on the slide, we're showing in gray 2019 and in, uh, in red 2020, well, there's no doubt when the first shelter in order uh, went, it went into place and in March and April, we saw a, a steep decline in, in activity, right? And, and a lot of that's because a lot of people didn't know how to buy a car if they could, uh, both from the dealer side, they didn't know how to sell it and, uh, and follow the rules and everything else. And so those things quickly uh, recovered and we watched in May and June where we actually outperformed 2019 uh, from a transaction base, and uh, and so we saw a lot of activity continue through the summer, and then it really flatlined. And you know the biggest thing I would say here is is at the end of the year we're only down four percent. And when you looked at you know IHS markets and, and and any of the other companies who were forecasting sales, especially new car sales for this year, you know they were already expecting a decline from 2019. I mean we've been in record 
setting years, year after year, uh, you know, 2018, 2017, 2016. And so, you know, we knew that there was going to be some tearing off. To see the activity only down 4% as we get through the end of October, I think it's a really positive sign for the industry, for dealers as a whole. Uh, some of that activity is being picked up from new car, moved into used car, um, and, uh, and, and, and overall, you know, we've seen a pretty good recovery. Well, it's an interesting way to look at that because when I look at this, this downward spike, you know, in March and April, you know, and then it starts to rebound again. And it didn't just rebound in a, in a you know, in a stair step. I mean, it rebounds, it rebounded fast. But then I look at some of the yeah. seasonally adjusted retail numbers, the SAR, that the country, you know, companies like IHS were putting out. And those numbers were down to 9 million in April. But they've started to rebound back. So it tells me that credit reports are a pretty big leading indicator as far as what we look at when we think about car sales and when we think about how we want to forecast, because we know that 90 plus percent of customers that buy a car finance it or lease it, less than 10% pay cash. So credit report volume is extremely important as it relates to that consumer journey. That's kind of the beginning point. Um, the interesting thing that I find with credit report volume is that it, it also it helps me understand what types of credit reports are being run, but also what types of financing people are looking for. So one of the things I think about is the average amount financed, because we know that car, car costs, sales uh, numbers continue to rise as far as the cost of the vehicle, be it new or especially with used this year, based on availability and inventory challenges and all that fun stuff, be it new or used. So what's really happened with the average amount financed? I mean, has, have people gone to, you know, contracting because of the pandemic, or has the average amount financed really spiked? Does TransUnion have any data on that? Yeah, as we get into these next three slides, uh, especially this first one, we talk about the, the amount finance. I think it's important to keep in mind the consumer perspective here and the fact that affordability is front of, ha, has been front of mind for several years leading into uh, 2020. Um, affordability became even more, um, you know, probably front of mind for, for many consumers as they started looking at their own households and if their, their households were going to be impacted by income. And it wasn't necessarily losing their job or being furloughed or anything else of that sort, but maybe losing a side job or, or additional, uh, a, a little business that they had at the house, things of that sort that provided some supplemental uh, income. But looking at the amount finance, we've seen a steady growth. It's been 4 or 5% uh, every year, just kind of continues to grow. And what's interesting is, as you can see, when we had heavy incentives uh, supporting longer terms at very low rates, uh, we see this nice little speak, uh, peak in new cars, which is represented in gray here, um, in, in Q2 of 2020, right when those incentive programs were being released. And so, it, you know, the, the, the anal uh, analysis in me, you know, it wants to look at this and say, well, that makes sense because people could have could buy more car, right? Because it was lower low interest rates, therefore, you know, their payments were still fitting that kind of affordability um, uh, threshold that they wanted to be in. Used cars, you know, pretty steady state uh, in growth, but they did pick back up as new car supply started getting shorter and those incentives pulled back as we look at Q3 in uh, 2020. Yeah, that's an interesting dynamic. I mean, it, it does correlate. When the programs are strong, um, you know, the, the amount financed tends to climb. Um, and sometimes we think of, you know, the credit side of the business as the afterthought in the industry. Let's get the customer in the car and then we'll get them in the box and we'll deal with it from an F&I perspective. But this year, when we think about dealer profits, F&I has really been carrying a significant load as it relates to dealer profits because of programs like this, because the average amount finance is up and was up in Q2. That's when we were really starting to see some tremendous numbers from a dealer perspective. So as we look at the data, it helps us not only validate, but also build correlation. That we know now when we think about planning next year, we know when programs get strong and support gets strong, that our numbers are gonna climb and we know what some of these trends may look like. As we get deeper into this, guys, we're gonna talk about some things that you should be looking at as far as how you adjust your strategy as you get into 2021, based on what you learned in 2020. 
what types of lenders you have, and things like that. And we're going to show you some data. So yes, the next few slides are going to be very data-driven and very data-heavy. So just hang in there because there's really some good information we're going to give you to be able to build that foundation so you in turn and we can give you some suggestions on what to consider in 2021 based on this data-driven intelligence, which is extremely important. The other piece of the equation is that we've now had three years of solid growth, as you put it, Josh. So now we have a lot of customers that we sold cars to that we can talk to as well. And we'll get deeper into that as we dive through a concept that we call portfolio management. Now, I'm interested on the used car side. You know, what's happened to the monthly payments? You show used cars up from an average amount financed by about 5%. What's been happening with used car monthly payments? Yeah, so, so what's interesting as we look at this next slide um, is, and, and we think about it, it's almost the inverse of, of what we saw from the new car side. So as people were financing higher amounts on the new car, but because they were so heavily incentivized or they were using longer terms, it made the used car market a little softer. And, uh, and what I mean by that is it, it was hard to sell a near new vehicle when you're competing with new car incentives and, and those incentives apply in extended terms. So when we know that people are trying to adjust in affordability, uh, we saw a big dip, you know, that same quarter in Q2 of 2020 in the overall uh, monthly payment uh, growth that, that consumers were willing to, to take. And a lot of that was because of new car competition, right? Um, once those incentives were pulled back, and uh, the, especially on the extended terms, which, which really impact payment. We saw used car uh, payment growth go back to, to its, you know, even pre-pandemic and, and what we were seeing at, at the end of last year. Wow, um, that's an interesting correlation. You know, I, I think about the used car market and how hot it's been, you know, and how, how successful it's been for a lot of stores. Um, you know, but at the same time, you know, there's another component that's really important. We talk about average amount finance. Um, we talk about um, the average monthly payment. What about term? Because that's another important aspect of it as well. What have you guys seen from a term perspective in the marketplace? Well, it continues to lengthen. Uh, no surprise in Q2. Uh, you know, when we saw 0% for 84 months being introduced for the first time, um, we, we, we saw, you know, basically a, a rise in that. Pretty steady in the used car line here, but in new car, you can see the, the extension of term going up as far as the average. Uh, there is some, some uh, pieces hidden inside of this as well in that the fact that leasing during this same period that people were taking advantage of these incentives, and I, I know we'll talk about more in further slides, but I'd like to bring out here, you know, leases tend to have a shorter term and then impact the overall averages. And so when you saw, you know, a good 10% of the market migrating from being a traditional lease customer, and, and you know, we've, set, we've seen record number of leases the last three or four years, all over 30% or a third of, of new car sales, and it actually dropped, you know, into the low 20s. And so almost a 10% drop to dealers' books as far as, you know, what consumers were choosing to do. And, again, I, uh, that behavior I think you can correlate directly to affordability and trying to hit that monthly payment that is so important to consumers. Um, and, uh, and you can see it reflected directly in the data. Again, the term overall continues to, to be extended as the amount finance goes up to, re to adjust for that higher amount finance and the affordability that consumers are trying to be in. That's going to impact dealer portfolios in the long term because instead of a consumer being back in the market 33, 34 months uh, or every 33, 34 months, they might now be, you know, 34, 30, or I mean 40, 41, 42 months uh, due to equity positioning and how long it takes because the cars they're purchasing are still depreciating on the same curve they've always depreciated on. And we may see a little spike here and there due to supply, but uh, they're still depreciating. And so, you know, dealers are going to have to be prepared uh, for programs and thinking about that if they have less leases going out and longer ter terms with their customers, what does that mean for customers coming back into the market? I think that's a great point. I mean, as I think about term, 
um, you know, and and people come maybe being in the being in the market a little less often or taking longer for them to get in the market. I mean, by the same token, some of those programs that were out over the summer were just incredible. When you think about 0% for 84 months, I mean, if I can use somebody else's money at no cost for seven years, I may stay in my car a little longer. Um, so that's where understanding that customer's ownership journey is extremely important. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail as we get into true portfolio management. But this may be a good time to ask you guys another question. So if I could ask the folks at NADA to drop our second question on the board, that would be great. As I think about term, how have those expanded terms impacted your dealership sales? If you guys could take a quick second to answer that, that would be great. And as we wait for everybody to chime in, you know, one of the things I hear from stores all the time is that, you know, 0% is out there for 84 months, you know, whether, and, and a lot of that happened on, on the domestic side as opposed to the import side or the luxury side. But even the import and the luxury side had some significant finance programs over the summer. You know, so maybe the banks weren't buying as deep. Maybe zero for 84 months was only reserved for those with absolutely stellar credit and in a great position from a vehicle equity perspective. Maybe people upside down weren't able to get that rate. Um, so that might be something to think about as you're considering answering this question. And I'm, what I'm looking at the poll right now, it looks like about 64% of you said somewhat, and about 7% of you said significantly. So if I look at somewhat and significantly, that's about 71% of people on the phone that with us today are telling us that those programs had an impact it, you know, from a sales perspective, that it hopefully helped your sales as opposed to hurt. So if we could take that poll question off, I'd like to jump into a little bit more detail um, behind that, because as I think about loan term, I also think about those extra long, long terms, you know, those 84 month terms. You know, what really happened there? Did it really have that much of an impact or was the impact even more significant than we thought? Josh, what does TransUnion find on that? Yeah, Pete, in this next slide, I, I, I mean, this is where the, the data geek in me really uh, kind of geeks out about it and, and showing the impact of it, right? So um, a lot of people may feel like they, they, it did or didn't have an impact, but we get to look at the data and see exactly what happened. And so in January and February, or what this chart's showing is kind of a breakdown of, of people who finance vehicles and what term they selected, right? And so we have it color-coded here to the right, broken into different groups. Um, you know, we're gonna kind of focus on that 60, uh, 72, and 84 months groups, but really focusing on the 84 months. When you look at January and February, the 14%, that's been a standard probably for the last two, three years. You know, it's maybe varied a little, 1% one way or the other, but the people who are willing to go that long a term were always kind of the same number of people. And so every so, month, so, we, we, so Josh, if I, if, if I might interrupt you for just a second, what you're saying here is that in April, for example, one out of every four vehicles was financing at 84 plus. Correct. That's incredible. Keep going. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, no, that, that's actually, uh, and if you compare it to what, what happened before, it's double. So the marketplace basically doubled the number of people reacting to 84 months. So when you think about, wow. you know, I, I, when, we, when we have conversations with the manufacturers and uh, their brand managers and, and, and others, and we talk about the effectiveness of incentives and the right message at the right time, um, well, you can see, you know, affordability was, again, top of mind for consumers. Zero percent at 84 months allowed them to buy more car, which we saw in previous slides, um, and get into that same payment range that they're normally comfortable with without having to feel like they're taking on additional costs or additional risk. And so, you know, in April, double the number of people who, who you know, who financed uh, went with 84 months. And then we saw that continue in May and then in, into June. But at, in June, it's really when we saw many of the manufacturers pull back on and, and restricted only to certain models, certain, you know, segments that they were trying to push. Um, and then, of course, you know, we've kind of seen that right out through the end of this year and you know so what some the, of that came from oh go ahead pete i was going to say what what's amazing to me 
is even when the industry, when the, when the manufacturers and the banks pulled back on those terms and said, you know what, we're not going to do it as much, there's not a month since March that those numbers aren't higher from a percentage perspective than where they started in January. That's an incredible statistic to me. So the closet data geek in me gets excited when I see that and say, wow, you know, if I don't think that the programs that are out there and that the strength of the lender plays a role in how I really sell cars and how I build my portfolio, um, then I'm really not looking at it the right way. So this is incredible information. You were going to say. Uh, I, I'm just going to call out, I mentioned before, uh, again, with leasing, and, uh, you know, what we found was a lot of these customers were previous lease customers. So it's very payment-driven. They're okay with their, their monthly payment being within a certain range. And uh, so as they were coming off lease, well, at the same time that these 84-month programs were being supported, leasing, on the other hand, was not being as incentivized and, or as supported. And so a lot of consumers moved over to that. And I think that's a flag for dealers to be aware of because that's going to that's gonna change. Uh, even if it's only 7 8% of your overall portfolio, uh, I mean, 7 8% is a significant number um, when we're looking yeah. to grow, it, it looks to continue to grow in the coming years. And so you really need to be thinking about how you're using data, what data is letting you identify the right customers, um, because there's going to be a lot of, you know, uh, off-lease customers who are, who, are, who are impacted and now being in, in a longer buying cycle than they typically would be. And that, you know, that is down the road, but it should be part of your developing strategy um, as you start to think about it. it. I mean, when we look at it, there was 4.5 million people that came off lease in 2020. And another four million plus are going to be coming off lease in 2021, and so wow. dealers really need to strengthen their lease programs um, because while while it was great to have these incentives and they did support uh, sales during a tough a tough time, down the road that those that that natural loyalty that leasing creates as a marketing program is impacted and, and will be impacted, and dealers need to be creative in how they're going to deal with consumers going forward. That's absolutely incredible. I mean, I think about, you know, those low, I'm sorry, those extended term programs that have really created an impact. You know, those extended term programs, especially during the, the peak of the pandemic when we were looking at months in April, May, and June, came with some astronomically low rates as well. So what impact did yep. that combination of those extended terms, but in addition to that, low rates really have? How did that really impact things? As, as far as you guys saw yeah. your volume. Yeah, I think as we move to the next slide, the, the biggest takeaway from, you know, a lot of data that you would see here is, you know, that I look at is, is one is incentivized rates have endured. So even as people pulled back on the term that they were at, they were still looking uh, at mostly incentivized rates, right? So what we would consider that under 3% APR um, that, you know, more often difficult to get, get to. Now, rates have been really low this year, so it hasn't taken uh, a, a lot to compete in that space. And so even some of the traditional banks and everything else have, have been able to compete with some of the incentivized rates that are out there. Um, you know, that's, but the one thing we can say is low rates are enduring uh, and helping, uh, you know, consumers reach that affordability threshold or that payment threshold that they were trying to get to. Uh, whereas, whereas the extended terms have pulled back, uh, the low rates continue continue to endure, and to be the trigger for a lot of consumers as they're looking at how they're going to pay for their car. No, that makes that makes a lot of sense. I mean, we talked about you know a lot of different things so far, and there's still a few more things we want to cover with you guys from a data perspective before we start getting into some significant recommendations. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask you is we continue to analyze and look at this data, but also gather some information, is it's a really good time for a poll question. So let's jump another poll question up onto the board. So if NADA could do that for us, that would be great. The question is very simple. How have expanded term terms impacted your dealership's leasing programs? Since we did touch on leasing, and Josh mentioned that 4.5 million people came off of lease this year, and also – Four million are coming off of lease next year. That's a significant number as I really think about it. What have expanded terms? How have they impacted your leasing program and your leasing? 
we'll leave that up for another quick second here. I mean, it looks like it's a little bit mixed um, with very little kind of leading the pack or, or not at all. Um, but we do see from the data that certainly there are more customers that have moved into those expanded term opportunities because the manufacturers really got exciting over the summer. They really looked at not just extended term when you were having 84 months, but you had rates at 1.9, 0%. Um, so as we look at that poll, a lot of you said it didn't have as much of an impact, but at the same time, if you look at the numbers, it may have had an impact because more and more people moved into extended terms. More and more people moved into low rates. Again, if I can use somebody else's money for seven years and not have to pay anything in interest to be able to do that, it's going to be attractive for me. It's going to make that payment because the, the term has been extended and the rate is zero, much more attractive and much closer to leasing. But most importantly is it's going to take me out of the market as a consumer a little longer. So how do I bring that customer back into the fold? We talked a little bit about it, and we'll talk a little more about it as well, but I really wanted to talk about portfolio management because that's how banks look at their, their ability to lend. They look at their ability to lend based on how their portfolio is performing. Are people paying or are they not paying? Are they paying off early? Because if they pay off early with a 9% rate, it actually costs the bank money at the end of the day. So that's how banks are looking at it. We as dealers should be really smart now and look at this in a smart way and say, how do I manage my portfolio knowing that more of my customers went into 84-month contracts at 0%? How do I capitalize on the fact that, like Josh said a little bit ago, in 16, 17, 18, 19, we had record years in this industry, which means there's a lot of people in my portfolio. It's using technology that allows you to have data-driven intelligence, things like an extended warrant, expand, uh, expired factory warranty, knowing that on the spot at your fingertips, knowing that a customer may be over miles on their lease right now, knowing that that customer's made 50 payments and they've got 22 left on their current loan, knowing that that customer's gas savings could be instantaneously changed because they, and, a, and by a dollar amount. So I can tell that to the customer when I'm talking to them. Having data-driven information at your fingertips and being able to put that in the customer's in the customer's purview allows you to become a consultant. It allows you to solve needs instead of sell cars. Um, so one of the things that banks do when they analyze their portfolio is they look at things like hardships. They look at things like, you know, risk managers are looking at worst case scenarios. So we've heard this term a lot this year, especially. Used to call it in the old days, we used to call it, oh, that guy got an extension or that lady got an extension. But now that term has been modified a little bit. We call it an accommodation. You know, so I'm going to ask Josh first to talk a little bit about what accommodations are, um, but also to really get into what's really been happening with respect to that, because that does affect a lender's ability to be aggressive. So what have you seen out from a transunion perspective on what's been happening with accommodations, Josh? Yeah, great question. And as we move into this next slide, you know, we, we wanted to go back and, and look at what, what steady state, because accommodations have always existed. So we wanted to look and see, you know, what steady state looked like, what happened as, as the pandemic hit and people were given accommodations uh, or given the option to, to have an accommodation, but maybe they, they still were very able to, to make the payments and everything else. And so what we saw, of course, going, you know, from our steady state into March and, and, and then in August, is uh, pretty pretty even breakout a, across all the credit spectrum or uh, the credit uh, group tiers, and uh, so you know a lot of people were receiving accommodations either through an extension, uh, not making a payment, or just being reported as, as being accommodated uh, in one way or, or or another. As those started to come to an end, and you see in August, and then more so in, in even in September. Most of the most consumers, I would say, in, in the prime and above bucket, were out of accommodation. They were back to normal and 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 operating as usual, and, and without a major uptick in uh, delinquencies or anything else in, in those spectrums. Uh, what we do still see is a large number of, of consumers in the near prime and subprime currently under uh, an accommodation. Uh, or another, right? So that could be either a payment holiday, an extension, uh, any different uh, number of mechanisms that lenders use for that. 
And, you know, while we look at that, we haven't really seen an, a, a sharp uptake in delinquencies. And, in fact, for the last, you know, decade almost, we've been at record low delinquencies since after the Great uh, Recession, right? And uh, it's continued to hold really low. So while those have upticked uh, some, you know, and, and we do see these accommodations, I would actually, um, you know, tell dealers that, um, it, this isn't the same as what the Great Recession was, right? And this isn't the same as what we looked at after 9-11 and, and things of that sort. Uh, one, lenders have a lot more capital, access to capital, so it's not a supply issue like what we had in the Great Recession where there was there was just no subprime lender that you could go to. Uh, the, we know several of our customers that we talked with and everything else, they're actually growing during this time. They're, you know, they're able to, to work with these different customers that are out there so my optimistic view on this and, and what I would communicate to dealers is while you may see in the news that, you know, there's still a good number of near prime and subprime consumers who are under accommodations and are waiting for things to come back, well, people are getting back to work. They're coming out of these accommodations better than they ever were going into, like, the Great Recession. Their credit card balances are lower than they ever were. Um, their other debts are lower. And so, you know, when this happens, Americans as a whole and consumers were in a much better position to, to weather this storm. And so therefore it's reflected in the supply in, in the, the ability to get credit. And, and instead of seeing like what we saw, you know, in 2009, 2008, uh, where, you know, subprime lenders were shutting their doors and the access to help support these customers went away. In fact, we're not seeing that at all. And, and these, these uh, lending institutions are still out there. They still have targets to grow. And so as these customers are coming off accommodation to get back to work, uh, they're going to also be looking for vehicles like they always have. And, uh, and we're, I think dealers are in a really good place to help support those, those customers, get them uh, into the right vehicle to get them back to work. And, uh, and, and so for 2021, you know, I imagine that this is going to continue to, to be that uh, trend and that dealers can take advantage of that. Well, you know, the thing that caught me more than anything in what you said is, is one thing. You said there's more money available today. So if we try to compare this to any other point in time, like the Great Recession or what happened after 9-11, we can't because we're in a different place now. We're dealing with something we can't control, which is the pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. There's already new orders in place in some states moving backwards again. But what we do know is that there's money out there. So the good news is that lenders still want to make loans, and honestly, they have to make loans because that's, that's how they make money at the end of the day. Not that we're saying that lenders are going to take the wheels off the bus completely, but at the same time, if, when there's capital out there, the thing we do know is that lenders, and Josh can attest to this more than anybody because of the work that TransUnion does with the lender community as well, they're analyzing portfolios a whole lot more than they ever have. They're using data from TransUnion and others to be able to drive their own decisions on how to manage their portfolios. So I kind of look at it this way. If the lenders are using data to drive how they manage their business and what moves they're going to make next, and if they're going to buy your next deal, well, isn't it incumbent upon us to use that data to be able to make decisions on how we're going to do business as well? And as I think about the subprime market and maybe where we may be headed, next year. There may be a, a spike in subprime opportunities. If you are not in a relationship, in a business relationship with a subprime lender or a near prime, near prime lender, you know who they are in your market. Develop those relationships because you can't just develop them when the crisis happens or when that downturn happens, and if it does, and then send them a bunch of bad paper and ask them to buy it. You have to give them a combination of good paper and bad paper to get them to take the risk on the bad paper. So develop the relationships now. Lay the foundation now. There's your one takeaway, I guess, from today. As I think about where I want to take this next and where we can see this going next, I want to recap what we've talked about, but at the same time, set the stage for what we're going to talk about for the next few minutes. And that is what do consumers really want at the end of the day? So let's jump into the takeaways next first from this section. Truly understand your customer. And we talked about those data-driven insights. We talked about how focusing on your leasing program is extremely important because we may not have 
those extended terms and low rates that we're talking about going into next year or even beyond. And then maximizing the profitability of your service lane. Your service lane has become the up lane. This is where you know customers are either coming in virtually or, or directly. Use this as an opportunity to know about that customer's ownership journey, all the facets of it, not just that they have equity in their vehicle, not just that they have made X number of payments, not just that they're getting a repair done, but understand the holistic view of that customer's ownership journey so we can make an offer to that customer to take them and put them in a situation to solve a particular need. So those are really the key takeaways today. So as far as I think about what's next, the thing that really cap captivated me when we were putting this information together is what do consumers really want at the end of the day? So our sister company over at IHS did what they call a vehicle buyer journey, and they did it this year during the pandemic. They interviewed tens of thousands of customers and asked them what they really want at the end of the day. You know, first they came up with data and said this is what who bought a new vehicle during the pandemic what, and how they bought that vehicle. Did they do it at the dealership? Did they do it partially online? Did they do it partially at the dealership? Did they go online start to finish? I mean, if we think about the mortgage industry today, we think about companies like Quicken Loans and, and Rocket, the Rocket app, the Rocket Mortgage app on your phone, where all I've got to do is put in my basic information into an app, and 30 seconds later, I've got a free approval for hundreds of thousands of dollars on a mortgage. Consumers want that ease. They want to be able to do things in a way that is conducive to the speed of life. But in today's environment, there are consumers that are apprehensive about coming into the dealer, about coming out because of the pandemic and where we're at. So the more we make it a seamless experience and the more we make it a virtual experience, um, the better off we're gonna be. And it doesn't just mean I'm going to put all my cars online and have a chat box so I can talk to my customers when they actually, you know, produce an inquiry of some sort. I want to be able to look at a seamless process that's really start to finish. And the area I think that the online portals have done a pretty good job of is they have created that end-to-end -end seamless and virtual experience where the customer can virtually sign docs, where all they really have to do is take delivery of the vehicle, whether it's in a virtual environment or at a particular site or location. But that puts the dealer or that puts the seller in a position to do things in a very, very creative way and allows them to be much more nimble in the marketplace. So one of the things that I noticed in we, as we look at this data is that customers do want that virtual experience. They really do want that at the end of the day. But as we think about those personalized experiences, can it be powered by credit data? Josh, what are your thoughts on that? Uh, so, uh, great segue into the next slide, Pete. And, and the, the answer is, is data can power almost anything. And so choosing the right set of data to power the experience that you're looking for uh, is very important. I, I think years ago, uh, Google did a study, talked about the micro moments in auto, and uh, there were five micro moments, and, and one of them was the can I afford it moment. And affordability has become top, top of mind, front and center. We've seen in our data, we've shown it to you guys you know, in the slides leading up to this, but now we're actually gonna show it to you in how consumers are actually engaging and why that's important to them. So what we did was actually look at volumes uh, for both online only dealers and, and your traditional brick and mortar dealers uh, over the last couple of years and in, in the use of the soft pool. Now, Pete, I think the question you're gonna ask me first is what's the soft pool, right? Yeah, I, and, I'm raising my hand. So, so Josh, what's the soft yeah. pool? Even the credit guy, yeah, so, what's the soft pool? So uh, uh, the best way to look at the soft pool um, it, it is is the dealers, most of you here uh, attending today are pretty, probably pretty familiar with the traditional pre-screen. And the pre-screen is a marketing list generated uh, where the consumers have the option to opt out and everything else, but, uh, but where you're pulling data uh, to put together a list and you're delivering a firm offer of credit. What's really taken off in the last six, seven years, especially in consumer lending and the personal loan space, is now entered into the automotive space, which you can see through this chart here, uh, and I'll get into, is the idea of consumer consent, where a consumer says, expressly requests uh, of, of that user, or of that dealer and or lender 
to help me understand what I likely qualify for and apply it into a shopping situation. So applying it to the actual inventory I'm looking at and understanding what kind of payment that's gonna mean for me. Because again, uh, from the data we've shown previously and the way that affordability address um, or, or is the biggest request from a consumer and, and, and at the front of their mind, they wanna understand you know, a $23,000 MSRP means nothing to them. A $450 payment does because that's what fits into their, their budget and that's how they look at what affordability and their cost of ownership is going to look like. And so getting that more upfront in the process for dealers uh, is, is, going to, is going to really help determine uh, winners and losers. And, you know, in, in this chart, I, we break it out by franchise and online only dealer. Um, and we can see the online only dealers here, you know, that, that exist out there they were some of the first to introduce these tools these, with, the, with the use of the pre-qualification soft pool and utilizing that credit data to allow consumers to understand affordability. Quickly though, we saw in 2020 dealers respond, introduce digital retailing programs, and, and, and some of those programs included uh, things like credit data. And so we, I, I look at this as accumulation, uh, not really a one or the other, generally consumer behavior is changing because they're more willing to engage in these kind of tools where they know that there's not an impact to their credit score, yet they, it allows them to understand what cars they can afford in their research phase or in the higher up in the funnel of, of you know, their, their consumer journey. And you know, the people who deliver this kind of experience are going to be able to, and you mentioned Quicken Loans and, and Rocket Mortgage and others, what they've done really well is build a consumer experience that's so easy to move to the next step that all of a sudden you have someone showing up with paperwork for the refinance you just did, and you didn't, you know, you didn't even intend to do anything other than see what kind of rates are out there, right? And, and that's where they've been so successful. That's where dealers are going to be successful by embracing tools that allow consumers to easily move through uh, and understand uh, you know what what's happening so it's about transparency it's about personalizing the experience and reducing friction so the other valuable thing about you know about these kind of leads that come into a dealership is is the overall value of the lead the quality of the lead right so when someone has has used their credit data that's verified through one of the credit reporting agencies right and we're able to know that this person is a person, not a Mickey Mouse or you know Donald Duck or anything else, but a, a real person. And you're able to see exactly what they're looking at, so that you can develop the right treatment strategy for that consumer as they're coming into your, your dealership, right? And so that you know how to work with them, uh, you know what what if anything would be a potential issue, how to, how to you know update your retailing strategy overall. And the quality of the data that's going into your CRM is much higher quality. So then you're going to be able to use it in the future for marketing uh, purposes and, and reaching out. So, you know, I, I can't uh, speak to how much this is really changing. It, it started really in consumer lending and, and personal loans, blew up in mortgage in the last couple of years. It's finally coming into auto. And I think the pandemic really um, accelerated that disruption and, and that use. But the reality is, is consumers are using these tools in every walk of their life and, and across their wallet, uh, so to speak. And so when they go, uh, when they start their auto shopping, they're going to expect, it's not just a good to have, it's going to be an expectation that they're getting these same kind of experiences and dealers should be prepared for that. That's a great point. I mean, how many times have you gone to the department store to buy a pair of shoes and, and at, the, at the counter they, they've already pre-qualified you? you know, for a, an either a higher line of credit or, or a new line of credit. Um, that happens all the time. Um, so it, it not just the auto industry, to your point. It's mortgage. It's credit card. It's it's person-to-person it's -person lending. It's all those different things. So why not the auto industry? And honestly, what you've talked about is segmenting. What you've talked about is really true, you know, even lead management, if I think about it. If I can find four people I know I can get financing for, and I don't have to go through subprime. I know I can get good financing for. 
So it's a faster process for me. Instead of the 10 that I'm looking at, I'd rather concentrate on the four. So it allows me to really manage my activities. And boy, can I be efficient. Because the other thing consumers want, and you guys know this, from all the things your manufacturer tells you about all the different focus groups and everything else that they do, is the consumer wants a seamless transaction. The consumer wants to spend less time on buying a car. The perception from the consumer is that I show up at 9 in the morning and I don't leave until 6 at night because I'm spending all day at the dealership. If most of that activity can occur and you're delivering the car and really personalizing the experience and showing that customer how to use all the gadgets, all the cool new technology, all the creature comforts in the car, that's going to make the difference at the end of the day. That's going to create higher levels of loyalty. That's going to give you more referrals at the end of the day. So the downward effect or the domino effect of just doing this one thing alone can be massive as it relates to your overall strategy. And this is fantastic insight. And we've cobbled this together as an industry, if you think about it, guys, for the last several years. We've said, oh, well, we're going to just, you know, deal with this on the phone. Or then we're going to, you know, put a, put a website out there and let our consumers pick a vehicle that they want. But then they're going to have to come in to really see all that information. And then we get to the point where, well, we're going to kind of work with the customer and start working on an initial price, whether it's email, text, back and forth, an online chat, whatever it might be. And then we start to add those different pieces. So we've kind of cobbled a lot of this together. But the thing that's been missing, by and large, in this industry is the ability to pay for the vehicle in a seamless, digital, and fast and efficient sort of way. And this particular piece to me is probably the most important aspect of anything that you could take away today. So to summarize very quickly, and I noticed first and foremost in our chat box, we've got a, a pretty fair amount of questions. So we'd like to be able to get to those questions as it relates to today's content. So please hang in there because I'm sure you'll pick up another tidbit or two from the questions that are coming up in a minute here. But we do know, guys, that the opportunity is out there. You know, whether those 0% programs came with rebates or without rebates, there are programs out there that are very strong. By the same token, we saw from the data Josh presented today and other things that we talked about, and even information you gave us in the poll question, the data-driven, intelligent business decisions are extremely, extremely important. And we know from everything else, especially that last slide you saw on what consumers really want. They want that end-to-end, -end seamless, efficient, and fast experience. Guys, we're in that consumer first era. That's the bottom line at the end of the day. So on behalf of myself and our team at Automotive Mastermind, thank you very, very much for joining. I'd like to personally thank Josh Abair from TransUnion for spending time with us today. Your participation is invaluable. Your content that you presented is great. And I'm going to move over to questions because we do have a few. And I'm going to give the floor to Ashley from NADA to take us through some questions. Ashley, the floor is yours. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Uh, as you mentioned, that was just such a great and informative um, presentation. So we appreciate both of you being here today. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions. So if you would like a question asked on your behalf, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. And while we uh, wait for a couple more questions to come in, a few poll questions just uh, appeared on your screen. We'd appreciate your feedback of today's webinar via the poll. All right, let me just dive right in. Um, all right, so Pete, how do we find more sales opportunities in the service lane? Sorry, guys. There is actually an enormous amount of opportunities in the sales lane. Um, statistically speaking, based off information our company has, about 40% of customers that walk into or that come into your service lane did not buy their vehicle from you. So that means for every 10 ROs that you get, there's about four customers who have come in that didn't buy from you. Now, they've come in for a reason, whether they're upset with the experience they had somewhere else, whether they've just moved into your area, you know, or whether they're just trying something different. You know, or they might not work in, the, in your area and didn't work there before. These people are here for a reason. To me, that's the best lead you could have out of the service lane. Not only do I have the people that have bought from me that are coming in, but I have a whole new opportunity with about 40% of my service lane, statistically speaking, of customers that are coming into my service lane that didn't buy from me. So there are 
tools out there that allow you to do those soft credit pulls that Josh was talking about. And by doing those soft credit pulls, I may be able to take those four down to two really quality opportunities. So now I can focus on two out of 10 instead of four or even eight or nine out of 10. So I can start to stack rank my opportunities every day just using one little piece of information. So that's where really the opportunities are in the service lane, and that's a great question, whoever asked it. And I appreciate you guys asking that. Ashley, what's next? Great, next question is um, with extended terms, how can dealers bring buyers back to the dealership early? Pete, you wanna kick us off? I'm sorry, could you ask that one more time? I missed it. No problem. With extended terms, how can dealers bring buyers back to the dealership earlier? That's a great question um, because in today's world, we're not going to see the volume that we saw from an internet perspective. And even if we do see that, we may not see the quality. There may be more virtual tire kickers because more people are at home and they've got more time on their hands. Is that I call them the virtual tire kicker. So how do we bring buyers back into the dealership a little earlier? One, we have to focus on where we've been strong. 16, 17, 18, and 2019 have been tremendous years in this industry. So we have built up a tremendous portfolio of customers that we've sold. Using data-driven intelligence, like knowing that that customer could be over miles on their lease, knowing that their factory warranty has expired, knowing that the new vehicle that you could put them in could save them $1,200 in gas over the next five years, or whatever that number is, knowing that that customer has made X number of payment and eight payments and has Y left, Knowing those things and being able to get to those things in, at my fingertips, being able to analyze that information within 30 to 60 seconds allows me to get on the phone and create those opportunities in my store. That's what portfolio management is. It's using data-driven intelligence to be able to manage a portfolio and take that to the next level. Now, Josh, do you have anything to add to that from a credit perspective? Yeah, you know, I, I would say one thing is, again, for the next two years, each year we have 4 million people plus coming off lease. That Those are 100% propensity. They're going to do something, either turn in the car, lease or buy another car, or, um, you know, buy out the, the lease itself. And, you know, if you don't have a good marketing strategy in place to target those lease-in customers, um, you know, it, this is the time to do it because – it's going to be a very competitive space, and you know whether they're your customers who lease from you before or they lease from someone else. Um, putting together the right strategies, I think, will help you sell cars in 2021. Well, that's a great point, Ashley. What's next? All right. So, based on the information we just saw, all things considered, should we brace ourselves for a difficult 2021? as it relates to the financial situation. Josh, you want to start kick us off with that one? Yeah, so so I think the, the biggest highlight I would take from this is is we've recovered well. Transactions are happening. We can see it in the data. Um, you know, I, I think in one of the additional questions, I'll try to combine it for the sake of time here, was, you know, when we look at inquiry volumes, are we also taking into consideration, you know, the, the fact that so many people are using the soft pull up front and while those are, are separated as far as how we look at it in the charts that I showed today, I, I would highlight the fact that a lot of that, a lot of that activity is going to start happening up front. And so, therefore, you need to be cognizant of what your digital retailing strategy looks like, how you're going to modernize it, and do it the right way. There's a lot of different providers out there you can talk to, um, evaluate them, and everything else. But underneath, it's at the core of what data are they using to get to it. And that's the question you should be asking yourself as a dealer, and how do I help support that? Um, again, the transactions, uh, uh, to answer that question, uh, did not reflect in that 4% differential. So I'm very optimistic uh, that, that we're going to continue to see, uh, you know, the, the normalization of the automotive market uh, through, the, through 2021. All right. I think we have time for just one more question. So, uh, Josh, I'll address this one to you. Um, 
When assessing a negative 4% decline in credit apps, what role does the expansion of digital retailing play in increasing credit apps? And is a credit app still as strong of an indicator when digital retailing portals have increased in numbers and shoppers may be testing? Yeah, so I kind of answered that in the last question, but I will call out, you know, the technology within the dealerships are getting smarter. Desking tools and knowing which lender you're gonna get to and everything else. Um, so while we may see an increase in the upfront, I also think the technology that's transitioning between the upfront and the end deal uh, is also gonna a lot smarter. And, and if you're using the right platforms and the, and the right data, uh, you're gonna be able to, uh, you know, deliver a better experience but as far as the way we'll look at it, I don't think it'll have a, a I, you know, I think one will kind of even out the other um, in the fact that, that the upfront, that the, it'll just transition from the back end to more of an upfront uh, transaction. All right, fantastic. Well, that is all the time that we have for today. Gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us. It was such a great presentation. Um, if you have additional questions that we didn't get to, or you think of something once the webinar has concluded, we of course invite you to connect with our presenters. Their contact information is on the screen now. And as a quick reminder, this webinar, along with other resources, are available to you and your entire team at NADA.org. And on behalf of NADA, Automotive Mastermind, thank you all for joining us. Have a great day.